Hello, my name is Michelle hawks Quayar, and I am the Associate Director of IWPR's Center on the Economics of Reproductive Health. And I have the pleasure today of introducing our President and CEO, Dr. C. Nicole Mason. She's a leading voice on pay, equity, economic policies, and research impacting women. For the past decades, Dr. Mason has spearheaded research on issues to economic security, poverty, women's issues, and entitlement reforms, policy information, and political participation among women, communities of color and youth, and racial equity. Dr. Mason is the author of Born Bright, A Young Girl's Journey from Nothing to Something in America. It's from St. Martin's Press and has written hundreds of articles on community development, women, poverty, and economic security. Her writing and commentary have been featured in the New York Times, MSNBC, CNN, NBC, CBS, Real Clear Politics, Nation, The Washington Post, Marie Claire, The Progressive, Essence, Bustle, Big Think, Miami Herald, Democracy Now!, and numerous NPR affiliates, among others. Without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce Dr. C. Nicole Mason. Well, I am uh, 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 Nicole Mason, and I run IWPR. For those of you who may not be familiar with our work, IWPR is the nation's only and preeminent think tank focused on building women's long-term economic security and well-being through sound data research and policy analysis and building women's power, increasing women's power and influence in society. Before we get started, I want to thank Dr. Ruth Schaber and Jen Stark, who have been great partners in this work and on this project. They came to us, uh, IWPR, with a great idea to help fuel the mo movement and arm stakeholders with timely data and resource to propel change and beat back restrictions at the state level. And we answered that call with this new tool that you'll hear more about today. I really have to be honest, I believe that we are in the fight of our lives in this moment. 2021 is shaping up to be the most devastating anti-abortion state legislature legislative session in decades. In the first six months of this year, 536 abortion restrictions, including bans, were introduced across 46 states. The Supreme Court, as many of you know, will hear a case that will have the effect possibly of hollowing out Roe versus Wade. The tool we've developed is another way to help us make a compelling argument about the need of women to have access to the full range of reproductive health options in their homes and in their communities. We know when access is blocked, women face enormous economic losses. Up to this point, we just didn't know how much. Our research, our new re this new research begins to point to just how much and the economic impact on women's long-term earnings, uh, as well as um, the impact of, of uh, the impact of these losses on the workplace. At the national level, state-level abortions restrictions cost $105 billion annually and, again, have a devastating impact on women's labor force participation. More importantly, our research in this tool makes the connection between these restrictions in states and women's economic security and well-being. It also invites businesses and other stakeholders to understand the economic impacts on these restrictions on workers and families. I am hoping that legislators, advocates, business leaders, and all of us will use this, use this tool as we continue to make the case for access to the full range of reproductive health services at the state level and beyond. So I'm really looking forward to the, to the, to the panel and also um, sharing uh, the tool with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And Again, welcome everyone. We have quite an exciting day planned for everyone. We'll start this morning with a panel that will focus on the research um, and the tool. Um, but before that, we'll get to hear a little bit actually of the results and Jeff is gonna make 
public and launch those results and show the website. Um, and that will be followed by a short presentation by Dr. Diana Green Foster, who is going to be talking about the turnaway study and what we have learned about short and long-term economic impacts of women who are denied an abortion. After that, we will have the panel, the cost of reproductive health restrictions and economic case for how harmful state policies can be. Then we will have a break. After that, then we're gonna have some roundtable discussions. It's a conversation series for the Center on the Economics of Reproductive Health. It's our terms, a roundtable on reproductive and economic justice given the urgent times. First, we'll have a moderated conversation, which Dr. Mason is going to moderate between Christine Clark from the Hewlett Foundation and Alexis McGill Johnson from Planned Parenthood. That will then be followed by a panel. It's our movement working at the intersections of reproductive and economic justice to improve women's reproductive health, freedom, and autonomy. And that also is composed of an amazing panel of speakers. And so we hope you're able to join for the entire webinar. And with that, I will turn it over to Jeff. Welcome everybody and thank you for being here. It's very exciting to always be, you know, the day that you're releasing new research. So we're very excited that you're here to join us in this effort. Um, as you know, Nicole and Michelle have said, you know, we are, this is a huge moment and a huge fight ahead of us. Um, we're, you know, acknowledging that the centrality of this issue to women's full participation in the economy and the labor force um, and how important um, reproductive autonomy is to their economic security. For businesses, we wanna you know, raise the issue that restrictions are, have costs to them and their bottom lines. And some of these are, are you know, dollars and some of them are things like reaching their goals around equity and inclusion. Um, Nicole mentioned that some of the statistics on the number of laws that are pending, um, but there's also in the Hyde Amendment, the federal level, um, that you know really, really can amplify the effect of these restrictions around funding and issues like that. And again, um, the slide was obviously made before Monday when the um, Supreme Court did announce they would take the case in Mississippi. And so um, Many, many reasons that we're all, we're here. We're excited to be getting this research out and into the world. Um, we do wanna, you know, in addition to coming up with the dollars that are at stake with these, these restrictions and what's, we do wanna also make sure we are raising up the, the, the idea that these are all hardest on vulnerable populations, lower income workers, disabled workers, um, women in rural areas, black and brown women. Um, and that, you know, that it's, these are the individuals that we've spent the last year thinking about how we need to make sure that they are incorporated into the economy and into the society fully and able to participate. And these, this is one of those issues that could help with promoting that as a goal. And as Michelle said, we, and Nicole said that, that to date, these, ec these economic costs have not been fully articulated. We are following into well-trod ground of other researchers and happy to be there. Um, but that we think this is the first attempt to try to really put some dollars on and especially dollars at the state level in terms of what these reproductive restrictions might mean for um, women, the states, the businesses there. Where, um, again, we are building on some previous work that came out from Rhea Ventures, Hidden Value, the business case for reproductive health. Um, we're using large public data sets from the federal government to, to do the costing piece. And we're also then really grateful for the great work that for 
many, many years. The Guttmacher Institute has done. Um, this, we, we use several pieces. One of the primary ones is their overview of abortion laws, which track state laws at the state level. Um, we've combined some of the categories. They, have, they collect a great deal of detail meticulously. We've um, done some grouping of the, of the restrictions they do collect into some categories shown here. We'll see them again. Um, and we've treated these as the number of state restrictions um, for much of the analysis. Um, states range from zero to eight restrictions in the system, you know, this, these class, this categorization. Um, there's one state, Vermont, with zero. We've got several states with seven or eight. Um, and so, you know, but a, quite a distribution, quite a range of states. Um, the cost that we've tried to, to estimate to build are the cost for reduced labor force participation rates um, in states with abortion restrictions. Um, women are less likely to be working and therefore less likely to be earning. And, they're, and so that's one of the primary drivers. The biggest one would be that women in states with abortion, abortion restriction, many abortion restrictions, have lower earnings than other women. Um, and these are based on statistical regression models with many other factors controlling for both the characteristics of the women as well as the regional earnings in those areas. So that, that we're not, you know, the states with lower earnings on average are not being disproportionately weighted here. Um, it's just across the country, all the regions. Um, we've also looked at labor turnover for mandated counseling and waiting periods, you know, how much extra, if people are terminated for those taking those time off and the time off to attend those extra sessions. Um, the first two are the large ones. So that the data is available today on this website that we, that is being launched and released and built, um, the costs of reproductive health restrictions. Um, it has a series then of maps that you can, and these are just the screenshots. We're not going to try to go live today, although it is up, it's up and running. Um, but again, so if across the country, as Nicole said, the state restrict state level restrictions cost $105 billion in terms of economic losses to the states and the businesses there. Um, And this is the this map here that just the total cost, the total dollars. So some states that aren't so bad in this view, like California, without very many restrictions out there, um, it's just a large state, large population. It, it you know one in six Americans is a Californian, and so it doesn't it it does show up as having a large cost. But um, we've also then provide some more relative versions. This is how much state GDP would increase if these laws were eliminated. And this view shows that you know the it's this it is the South and the central US where the most restrict restrictions have big impacts on the state economies. And if you float over the states, you can get you know some more information on that state, and then you can drill down and click to learn more about the state. And so it's an interactive map feature on the website. We also then looked at sort of what is the, how much, how, what would the percentage increase in the size of the labor force be in the states? And so again, this is another relative view. Doesn't look that different from the previous map, but it's a different statistic. And so it's a different metric to be thinking about. Again, as we're trying to make the business argument that again, more people would be in the labor force. We, we are hearing a lot about trying to get businesses reopened and um, up and running again. And it's, and this is, you know, a piece of that puzzle too. And so that nationally here, we have that if all the restrictions were to go away, we'd see like a, a half a million more women age 15 to 44 in the labor force. And so again, we've also tried to highlight the impacts this has, um, you know, this the reproductive justice issues have with intersectional economic security views and how this is really important for the well-being of black, brown, lower income, 
LGBTQ women and their families. Um, so we're trying to, we've tried to look at, you know, we do see in our results that there are slightly larger increase in layer of force. These are the national level numbers. Um, slightly greater increases in labor force participation among Black and Latina women, and earnings would go up for Black women more than most other groups um, without these restrictions. So that we do think that these are key to trying to push back against structural racism. On the state pages, we've also tried to highlight the, the state, the dollars and the, and the impacts at the state level, and also tried to include the diversity lens, um, the intersectional approach to the data so that we can keep the focus on those issues. Um, and that we've tried to make it so that information can be easily incorporated into state level messaging and um, taken away and repackaged and used um, in your state level campaigns with your local leaders, political or business. Um, And so again, the, we've also, you know, so when we look, try to take the big picture, you know, we can see that some of the states that have many, many restrictions would stand to gain the most in this analysis um, from getting rid of their laws. And so we can show that the, the five states that would gain the most in terms of GDP have, again, most, and so, and their large dollar amounts are for both turnover, business costs, um, the increase for labor force participation would be largest, and the increase in earnings would also be largest um, at the top level. And we can look then what the, the total dollars are large and, and large impacts on GDP, which this slide is highlighting. Um, but there's also, again, if you try to take another relative measure we've tried to look at was what's the per capita for women, per capita dollar amount per women, per woman age 15 to 44. And so you can see that, again, we're talking several thousand dollars each year for women in those age ranges. And then we also, you know, you can look at the states by that aren't so fewer restrictions. Again, California and here, Vermont has zero. Um, and, you know, the dollar amounts are relatively smaller. And, you know, we think that, you know, the results made sense. And so, yep. Yeah. so we're, releasing this today. Hope it's useful to you and looking forward to hearing about the turnaway study next um, and how this fits into the larger, longer term picture. Thank you, Jeff. And we did put on the chat. Everyone can now is the link for the website. So please check it out. And now we'll just hear from Dr. Diana Green Foster for a few minutes before we jump into the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. My goal is just to set um, some of the uh, personal context of um, how abortion access affects women's economic well being, people's economic well being, to set the context for that um, very important uh, high level report on uh, access, how uh, restrictive abortion uh, rules affect uh, people at the state level. So Economic hardship is often people's reason for seeking abortion. The Guttmacher Foundation has found that uh, women seeking abortion nationally are disproportionately low income. And I have found through the Turnaway study that economic insecurity is a leading reason women give for wanting to end a pregnancy. Um, it's the most common reason. And yet it's also only the, it's rarely the only reason. And as a woman uh, from the Dakotas said about her reasons for abortion, she said, her reasons were all financial, me not having a job, living off death benefits, dealing with my 14-year-old son. I didn't have money to buy a baby spoon. Economic hardship also makes it more difficult to get an abortion. What we find in the Turnaway study is that a lack of money is a leading cause of delay in seeking abortion care. More than a third of the women in our study are slowed down, trying to raise the money to pay for the abortion and pay for travel. And when women pay out of pocket for their abortion and for their travel, it's often more than a third of their monthly in personal income. So for more than half the people, it was more than a third of their monthly personal income was spent to try and get an abortion. 
And as one woman from Kentucky said, I couldn't afford it. They told me it was going to be $650, but by the time I was able to raise the $650, they had to do a different procedure and the price went up. And this snowballing of barriers is amplified by restrictions which uh, increase the travel time, increase the cost of getting an abortion. Um, the Turnaway Study is a nationwide study of women who received an abortion and women who wanted an abortion and couldn't get one. And one of the biggest set of results is that uh, not being able to get a wanted abortion has severe economic consequences. So we find, and I'll just show you a couple graphs because I can't help it, um, that women who uh, seek abortion are more likely to live in poverty if they're denied the abortion than if they receive one. They're more likely to report that they can't afford basic living expenses like food, housing, and transportation. And these economic costs extend all the way to their existing children. The children they had when they sought an abortion um, are more likely to be raised in poverty. And I'm going to show you some of those findings. This is just the green is people who are denied an abortion and the blue is those who receive it, their chance of being below the poverty level over the five years. Here's their chance of reporting that they don't have enough money to pay for food, housing, and transportation. And this is um, their existing children, whether they, the mom was denied an abortion or received an abortion, changes the chance that their existing children are raised in poverty or raised in a household with not enough money for basic living needs. And so just a couple of quotes from people. This is a woman in North Dakota who, um, you know, often people want an abortion because the circumstances are not good then. It doesn't mean they never want a kid. They want to have some control over the circumstances. And so this woman received her abortion and she said, it probably would have been the worst thing for that child to come into this world because it never would have had the support it needed. Um, and she uh, had a baby later after receiving an abortion. And so she's comparing the experience. She says, I have a one-year-old now and I'm able to support myself, able to support my kids and know the timing is right. And one more is a woman from New York who was denied the abortion and um, she had the baby and found that she was unable to raise it. And so this is um, her thinking back of how difficult it was to be pregnant when she didn't wanna be and her, how hard it is to support her child and therefore she's dependent on someone who's not trustworthy. She said, it's very, very difficult to find a job when you're pregnant, to keep a job when you're pregnant or find and maintain a job with a baby, especially if your partner doesn't wanna help. So domestic violence skyrockets because you're financially dependent on your partner because you have to be home with the kid. Uh, pregnancy is an incredibly scary thing if you cannot trust the person you're with. And just a quick pitch, if uh, you want to see more data or more stories, please um, check out our book, uh, The Turnaway Study. It's newly out in paperback in a week or so. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diana. And I'm now gonna turn things over to Jeanette Burns, who is an independent journalist and one of the early journalists in terms of being mainstream and writing for places like um, Protest, New York Times, Forbes, and Gizmodo to talk about the endless cost of maligning abortion. And she's gonna be moderating the next panel and I will turn it over to her. Thanks, Janet. So much, Michelle. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us and for the amazing panel's lineup that we have uh, for the next couple hours. Um, as Michelle mentioned, I'm an independent journalist and freelance writer, and I've had the privilege of learning, really increasing my knowledge about abortion practices and restrictions in the U.S. over the past few years, as well as um, the economic case um, for ending these normal kinds of restrictions that we're going to talk about on the panel. Um, so you've already gotten to hear a bit from Dr. Diana Green Foster, who is professor of obstetrics and gynecology, as well as reproductive sciences and the director of research for the Advancing New Standards in Reproductive Health Center at the University of California, UCSF. Um, we've also heard a little bit so far from Sina Cole Mason, who is president and CEO of the Institute for Women's Policy Research, our host today. Um, we're also very privileged to have Representative 
Darshan Kendrick from Georgia State's Representative House District 93. And joining us from the business community is Jim Doyle, president of Business Forward. So welcome to our panelists. Thank you so much for coming. I think, perfect. I thought that we could start things off by um, introducing individually a bit of the work that we do and what brings us to this field. Um, in short, why reproductive rights? Um, what has driven you individually to come into this field? Um, I thought we could start with Diana, who um, whose research, yeah, spans spans decades and various topics, as she's indicated. But um, yeah, so what are what brought you into this field and to doing the work that you're doing? Um, I think that um, what you know, I've um, what is missing often from the abortion debate is any tie to real people. And so what what is needed around research is to um, actually listen to the people who are affected. And so that's my desire is to um, be able to uh, um, gather the compile the, the experience both in terms of data and in terms of sharing the stories of real people so that we can stop having an abstract debate and um, start having an empirical debate, having an empathetic debate, have, a, have something where there's some context about the real people involved. And, and this is not, this is also to say that the state level information is super important. And I would love to hear from the, um, the, the um, policymakers on the panel, but to that, you know, that it's different kinds of data, including state level data, are, I think, may be what's important for changing policy. Thank you so much for that. Um, and just to help help folks sort of wrap their minds around this tool that I'm very excited about, and I know a lot of people are hoping to to use for ad advocacy across the business spectrum and in their communities. Um, do you feel that we can ever fully quantify the short and long term costs of reproductive health restrictions? Is that is that a doable thing? Um, uh, it, no, it, it, it's so much more beyond dollars, but uh, it's not just a question of uh, costs. And I think, but costs are an extremely important part. And it is motivating to policymakers. It's motivating to people with a, a business perspective and um, to all of us that this to humanize the experience and to understand that real people are involved and that um, will never capture all the emotional context of people making this decision of people being in this uh, position, but anything we can do to try and increase empathy and increase understanding would be um, a huge step in the right direction. Thank you. Um, yeah, speaking about, you know, real people's experiences and, you know, what this can look like in communities if not just one or a couple, but you know, maybe thousands or hundreds of thousands of parents are facing this sort of challenge. Um, I'd love to turn to you, Representative Kendrick or Darshan. Um, in Georgia over the past few years, we've definitely seen um, some of the most aggressively restrictive and potentially harmful laws coming out uh, alongside many other states. Um, and something that has also struck me in being aware of the situation in Georgia is seeing a, a bit of a, a national response. You know, people are not sure, for example, if the film industry, which works heavily in Georgia, you know, should boycott, how should they um, respond to that one? So yeah, I'd love to, to start off with you, anything that you can share about um, what impacts have been like in your community, any lessons from um, on the ground with your constituents in the past two years? Yeah, thank you. And thank you so much. Glad happy to be on this panel. Um, so in 2008, Georgia um, instituted or, or uh, introduced HB 481, uh, which was at the time one of the most restrictive um, pieces of legislation. It was called the Heartbeat Bill, um, which I dispute that whole name, but it was called the Heartbeat Bill under the assumption that at six weeks when you can hear the heartbeat, um, that women should not be able to mm. get um, an abortion. 
And uh, me and a group of black women really led the charge on um, pointing out the disparities that other speakers have pointed out in their presentation about how it disproportionately affects black women. Uh, my district is um, about 75% African American. Uh, it's been that way since I've been here um, since 2010. And Georgia has one of the highest mortality rates for women, but particularly black women, you are three times as likely to die in childbirth in Georgia if you are a black woman. No matter your background, education, how much money you make, none of that matters. Um, and so we were really able to, uh, I think, bring awareness to that particular issue um, because uh, while 481 was going through the General Assembly, there was this sort of uh, assumption that Georgia was protecting women and, and protecting, you know, um, everybody when in fact we were high on the scale for infant mortality and for maternal mortality. So there was a hypocrisy that was underlying the passage of that bill. Um, I will tell you since 481 passed um, that it has been challenged in court. Um, and uh, of course it was, it was thrown out of court because it was blatantly uh, unconstitutional. Um, but as you say, we have this Mississippi case that is going to make it all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, and that was their whole plan the whole time. One of the things that I have really, really learned being elected the last decade is that this um, attack on reproductive rights didn't just come up. It just didn't, you know, manifest in 2008, uh, excuse me, 2018. There was a concerted effort um, to do this long before 2018. And so we really have to do a better job of being prepared, um, coming with the talking points that, um, as Diana said, that relate to everyday people and explain to people that it is very more, it's more nuanced than deciding, you know, if a woman should give birth or not. It's, it's a lot more nuanced than that. So um, that's what's been going on in Georgia. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Yeah, and um, I appreciate your bringing up the point once again that you know, in, in your state and across the country, um, black and brown women and parents, um, I'm aware that IWPR recognizes that not all parents who are pregnant are women, but for the sake of processing data that's available today and in the gender conforms that are available. Yeah, but yeah, that, that black and brown women have borne born this struggle the most um, financially as we see in the data, as well as in so many other aspects of their lives and that this, does trace back to um, our history of slavery and oppression in this country. Um, so it's an interesting relic today to see in, in women's reproductive health. Um, I wanted to switch over to Jim for a minute. Um, you have been working in the business community on this issue for several years. Um, you have helped bring folks onto a signed on letter in support of reproductive rights. You have been a very active advocate. Um, taking a look at the data that we have that we're discussing on this panel, is there anything that really struck you or stood out um, either in spite of the experience that you've gained over the past few years or perhaps because of it? Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, uh, what's uh, uh, Number one, the, the numbers are alarming, uh, but I think it's important for people to understand that they're just part of a much larger problem. So. Um, Business leaders with whom we work see abortion rights as just part of a suite of rights and services that families need uh, if women are going to be able to enter the workforce and stay there and prosper there like they should. Um, and you know the, the challenge we face is that women are underrepresented in high paying jobs, they're overrepresented in uh, low paying jobs, they're overworked at home and they're undermined at the office. And as a result, um, you know, they're earning 82 cents on the dollar to men, and that's having an enormous impact on families' financial security. Two out of three women are principal breadwinners for their family, yet we also expect them to do three times more of the work related to school and twice as much of the work related to the home. Um, and there's just this enormous pressure. And so uh, the business leaders with, with uh, which we work uh, are, are most effective when they talk about how abortion rights are just part of the solution, paid leave, childcare, um, carrying economy reforms like the ones uh, that have uh, been put forward in the uh, President Biden's uh, uh, American Families Plan uh, proposal, um, 
sexual harassment laws. These, so it's, this is all part of a, a larger problem and the larger problem is massive. So Beth Ann Bavino is the chief economist uh, of S&P, which is a very large rating uh, agency in the, uh, in the world. And um, she estimates that if women were to be able to participate in the economy at the same rate men were, it were in the workplace, uh, our economy would be a trillion dollars larger. So what we find is the best way to make the case for abortion rights is to tell the, the larger picture. Um, and uh, and that's what our business leaders do. And um, uh, it, it, um, it, there's a, a related argument that our business leaders make, which is that um, you know, communities' economies are only as strong as the, uh, the community's sense of community. And when you're putting this kind of pressure on families, if you're taking away these kind of services, um, it really breaks down the, 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 the strength of the community in ways that have an enormous economic cost. Thank you. Um... I'd like to hop over to Nicole next, um, just following up on, on some of what Jim said about the, the stakes here, the, you know, the alarming numbers and just the, the scale of impact of, you know, even if a state's women workforce is decreased or impressed by 1% or 2%, this can be, you know, millions or in some states get billions of dollars. Um, yeah, in, in your, so to form that into a question, um, yeah, at, in your role leading IWPR of the past couple of years, um, what have some of your priorities or takeaways been in terms of um, appreciating and presenting this economic case? So I, first of all, I wanna thank Jim for those um, really great points in making the connection between you know, women's economic, excuse me, women's reproductive freedom and autonomy and the cost to businesses and also making the link between women's roles in homes and in families in terms of their disproportionate share of caretaking responsibilities, especially, uh, especially in this moment. Um, so I've been doing this work for about two decades now. And I remember um, somewhere I had heard this, this um, stat statistic or saying about, well, abortion may be legal, but we're gonna make it hard as hell to get. And that was like 20 years ago, I remember hearing that. And then to be here today and see the number of restrictions, trap laws, and the difficulty women have accessing abortion, um, it, you know, it really is not about, um, we've, been, we've been in this fight trying to hold the line, stop these restrictions, roll them back, and they and um, it, we've been losing in some ways. Uh, so here we are in this moment, you know, trying to build, I think what we're hoping to do with this tool, this tool is to build a broad coalition of partners, um, both in the women's movement, legislators, business leaders, um, who can really work together arm in arm to push back and fight back some of these um, restrictive laws with hard data research and understanding the link between these these laws and the economy and the impact these laws have on women's economic security and well-being. Um, and here at IWPR, that you know that is our goal, um, not only to provide this data and research, but really point it in the direction it needs to go to to make clear policy uh, change and impact. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll, you know, say is that when I think about what this really means, um, and you know, my work has focused over the last, you know, few decades on winning women's economic security. Um, but I do think that when women are economically secure, um, they um, have you know, access and understand and are able to make choices about their bodies, their reproductive choice, their, you know, violence. I mean, all the things that we're talking about uh, here is related to women's economic security. So there is a very definitive link between the two. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to how we will be able to use this tool, um, you know, at state, at the state level with, you know, Representative Kendrick and across and in, in, in other states to really, um, again, beat back some of these restrictions. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to turn it back to Diana for a moment, um, as we're talking about the, the relationship between the ability to get abortion care or various reproductive services 
and financial stability for such an enormous amount of our, our population here. Um, the tool is, has been useful and the, the data I've been able to see leading up to it in seeing many of these impacts after the fact, if someone is denied an abortion or is unable to affect them, how much they might be. Um, but something that I know um, various of you have, have done work around or talked about is um, the upfront costs. When you're in that moment and trying to make a reproductive choice for yourself, um, the things that can make that choice so difficult and just preclude that sort of autonomy and stability right away. Um, and something, uh, Diana, when we spoke a couple years ago for an article in Forbes about the Turnaway study, um, you pointed out to me that some of these restrictions, say six weeks, eight weeks, um, in many cases before a parent even knows that they're pregnant or has been able to confirm that, um, the costs of getting that care changes over time. Would you mind talking about that a little bit and the hurdles that people face just right out of the gate trying to find this care? Yeah, uh, Dr. Mason completely captured it, that the strategy was to make abortion as difficult to access as possible. And until yesterday, we I didn't really believe that they were going to try and legally restrict access to all abortion across all states. But that the, that the strategy really was to pack so many restrictions that um, people didn't notice that that abortion access was eroding until they were in the position of needing one and realizing that they were going to have to make a ton of phone calls, a ton of visits, travel uh, and calls in order to just try and find somebody who could do their abortion. And um, the, the burden is really not to be underestimated. Uh, it's difficult even in the few states where abortion is covered through the Medicaid program. And it's much, much harder in the states where it isn't covered through the because of the Hyde Amendment. So there is, um, I think it's underappreciated how difficult abortion is to access. And it seems like it's really the product of a concerted effort by people who are opposed. And they were really under the radar before, and this latest decision is really not under the radar. So I don't know what the effect of us all paying attention to it is, but your point that people don't, some people don't realize they're pregnant, and that is a leading reason people are late in seeking abortion care is they didn't have symptoms. They have symptoms, but there are symptoms that are in common with other conditions they have, chronic diseases or recent pregnancy. And so people don't realize they're pregnant. And if you put a gestational limit, that's who will be affected. And when we look at it statistically, it's very young women who've never been pregnant before are slower to recognize pregnancy. People who um, were are you know taking hormonal contraceptives, and so they think they're protected from the um, from an, an unwanted pregnancy, and and don't realize when they are pregnant again. So it's. Um, it's not most women having abortions um, have it early, but when people are late in recognizing pregnancy, all of the restrictions, all of the logistical burdens snowball to make it much more likely they'll be denied care entirely. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I'll keep an eye on time. So I know we're gonna wanna take a few questions towards the end. Um, Let's see. I was hoping to um, follow up with you, Darshan, about um, the yeah the six week went, um, ban on abortion in Georgia. I hope you made reference to, and that is being challenged. Um, just to you know, throw one back to the business community, I know that there was such a response as as more awareness has come about in the past few years about laws like that. Um, one of the responses for better or worse, perhaps you can shed light on this, um, was the idea of a boycott. Um, I know in, there are different companies that say have failed to show their support or duly provide support for different communities and different fights for civil rights, um, You know, whether it's say abortion or LGBTQIA um, over the past few years. And we've seen these sort of mixture of responses. Um, which I think shows a desire to stand up for what's right, but maybe also illustrates the fact that understandably, um, CEOs or local chambers of commerce might not know the best way to support. Um, would you mind um, just giving us a few thoughts on 
whether or not the, the boycotts that we heard about in Georgia had an impact, had a good impact, and maybe what you're thinking about um, for strategies going forward that will be effective in, in your community. Yeah, thank you for that question. So with respect to uh, to boycotts and Georgia just passed the horrendous voter suppression law. So we are apparently very good at bringing up boycotts, um, but um, it depends on who you ask. So personally, um, I don't want to do boycotts because uh, like I said, my district is filled with the most vulnerable people. So if the people that are going to get hurt by these boycotts are going to be my own constituents. So I am looking and working with allies to look at different ways of uh, making that presence known that uh, this is unacceptable. And you're right, a lot of CEOs um, don't want to tread into, into this territory for any, any number of reasons. Um, but really, um, what I try to get, um, since most CEOs um, are male, is I try to get them to understand, um, you know, the, the perspective from a woman, the, the CEOs that we have meetings with or that come to the Capitol. Um, during the debate on 481, the heartbeat bill, uh, one of the things that I uh, did that went viral was come up with a testicular bill of rights. It was a play on, um, them trying to um, to regulate women's ovaries, and so I came up with this list of things um, and flipped the script on you know regulating men and what they could do with their bodies, um, and it got a, a lot of national attention. And um, Georgia is home to uh, about eight Fortune 500 companies, um, and I, I got a lot of positive responses, not directly from CEOs, but just from people. Um, who are powerful and in those business communities because they never sort of thought about it from, you know, a perspective of a man. It's like, well, you're doing the same thing, you know, um, trying to take away a, a, a woman's right to choose and, and, um, and was able to, to demonstrate that. And particularly here in Georgia, the governor always boasts about us being the number one place to do business, the number one place to do business. Um, but uh, women... Um, for the third year, for actually about the fifth year in a row, we are the um, highest, um, third highest um, state to have female entrepreneurs. Uh, so we have a lot of female entrepreneurs who are becoming uh, entrepreneurs in this state. And Atlanta is the number one place in the United States for the growth of women, excuse me, uh, Black businesses. And Black women particularly um, are the fastest growing business sec sector for entrepreneurs. Um, so connecting that with um, the fact that if we're going to want to be the number one place to do business, we need to support that segment that is actually growing here in Georgia, which is females, which is Black women entrepreneurs here in Georgia. Um, and so you can't have it both ways. Um, and so that's really what I have been trying to uh, instill into our business community here in Georgia. Um, and unfortunately, you know, 481 did, did still pass um, and trying to get corporations to be more vocal ahead of the fact as opposed to after the bill is passed is still a very, very, uh, it's one of our um, hardest things to do here in Georgia because everybody wants to say that they didn't like something after it passed and that doesn't really do us any good here in Georgia. That's an excellent point. Yeah, no, th and thank you so much for that. Absolutely. Um, and I'd, I'd like to, to uh, one of the many good points that you made um, allows, I think, a pretty smooth segue back to Jim. Um, I was, when Michelle was filling me in about this panel and she told me about, like, oh, you got a guy, great. You know, it's lovely to, to have you doing this work and be able to speak with you about it. Um, so yeah, I just um, sort of loosely or informally, yeah, I'd love to hear what your experiences have been, Jim, in spreading the good word here um, and, you know, sharing sharing what you've learned along the way. Um, are there any strategies that you would recommend for other you know, non-women folks in business who want to yeah. spread these conversations? Well, I, I've, I've got the good, bad, and, and then what you do about it. Uh, so the, the first is good is, uh, Darshan's absolutely right. Georgia is a remarkable state. We work in all 50 
Uh, we've got a big presence in about 125 cities and it's not just Atlanta, it's, it's across the state and you've got this remarkable collaboration among venture capital firms, uh, franchises. It's, it, it, Georgia is also like a home to a, a lot of the big franchising companies. It's one of the reasons why African-American women are um, uh, prospering so much is because franchising offers a, a good tool for them. Um, and there's just a lot of collaboration between community groups and business in the state. So uh, she's, she's, she's really sort of harnessed a very powerful force. The bad news is um, the Fortune 500 companies are very reluctant to speak on this issue. So when three years ago, uh, Planned Parenthood, NARAL, and a bunch of other very large organizations did something really effective, and they recruited 190 CEOs to sign a letter in support of abortion rights, which was published in the New York Times. And it's a very strongly worded letter, and it's sent a clear message that big business um, um, uh, does not like abortion restriction laws, abortion bans. Um, they didn't get a single Fortune 500 company to sign. So they had a lot of businesses, but not a single Fortune 500. Um, and um, so you, you, what you need to do is you need to go where you can have an impact. And the good news is small business leaders can be enormously effective as advocates uh, and they have more autonomy. Small business owners are also really effective because they can localize the issue. What, is an, what does an abortion ban mean for us in, here in uh, Columbus, Georgia? What does an abortion ban mean for us here in um, this community in Atlanta? So, so small business owners are actually can be as effective or more effective than big businesses. Um, and if you waste your time just trying to go after some of these major, major companies, you, you're, you're going you're gonna to be, um, you're going to end up being disappointed. So what we do is we organize briefings where we go out and recruit business leaders who care about issues, but they have a business to run. These are civic minded, results oriented business leaders who care about issues, but they need someone to explain to them you know, what's at stake, help them talk to a, teach them how to talk to a reporter or a, a, a state official, and above all, um, only bother them when there's something they can do about it. You know, a lot of advocacy groups, like I, I'm on immigration reform uh, list, and I get a letter about dreamers every week. You know, there are three opportunities a year to do something about dreamers, but I get an email every week. You can't go out. So what we've learned is it's really important to reach business leaders um, show them the larger picture about how this relates to women's economic empowerment and how women's economic empowerment helps families and boosts our economy. Again, it's a trillion dollar question. If, if, if you wanted the biggest thing we could do to grow our economy, it's to help women enter the workforce, prosper there and stay in. That's, that's it, that's the, biggest, that's the biggest lever we have. Um, so um, one of the things you also have to recognize, however, is you need to make sure when you get people to go out and advocate uh, for abortion rights that you prepare them. Uh, because uh, even if they say and do everything right, there's someone who disagrees who's going to take what they say out of context and use it against them. So we, what we do is we spend a lot of time making sure people are prepared to take action and that they're prepared for what's next. Um, what you'll find is there's just safety in numbers. So um, you know, when, when, when the big organizations were recruiting all those CEOs, we were working with about 2,500 local business leaders um, uh, including a lot in, in Georgia. Um, we've worked with about uh, 4,000 business leaders across the state over the years on a variety of issues. But um, I would advise everyone, uh, go local uh, and, and really incorporate advocacy into a larger training program. That's great. I think um, that's also a wonderful segue, I think, to a last round. We can go around and get people's um, thoughts and tips. Um, and I, I really appreciate your point too, that while it may, it may be tempting, even after I finish moderating this panel to, to send a tweet or something to Fortune 500 companies, let them know that, you know, we're, we're thinking about them. Yeah, the small businesses that make up Georgia and make up New York where I live in the US, um, yeah, they know their workers, they know what their workers are facing, they need workers right now. And there's just such a patchwork of local and state laws that are affecting this area that, yeah, really, it, when big business does, you know, as it moves more into this field, they're probably going to need well-trained specialists, people in HR that are aware of all these laws just to keep track of all your locations. Um, I know that Darshan needs to hop off in a few months, so would you like to share any last thoughts with us about, you know, how you hope to see folks using these resources or um, data going forward, things, support that you'd like in your fight in Georgia? 
Well, I just um, hope that we are able to um, do a lot more collaboration. Of course, anybody can follow me on my Twitter account. It's just at Darkshine Kendrick, and I will uh, repost as much as I can interesting information. Um, and I really think this is an opportunity. Um, listen, I mean, in the legislature, the average age is like 60. So uh, I'm not sure if um, I, I can necessarily get other colleagues to uh, use this too, but I think it would be very, very effective to get our next generation um, used to it and, and, and amplify it on social media. Um, and, and the other thing I like to say is there is, um, if anybody can solve this issue for me, I think you'll be a very rich person. Um, we, we had a RIFRA bill, and forgive me, I don't remember what RIFRA stands for, but essentially it would have allowed discrimination of private businesses to those that were gay or LGBTQ. Um, and we were able to use an economic argument and say, hey, if this is going to um, devastate our economy and the state, and you know, you'll have all these people that are gonna pull out, and it worked, before we were able to pass the bill. And I'm so confused as to why is it every time there seems to be an issue on women's issues, um, all of a sudden they get cold feet. Um, and so if anybody can solve that um, dilemma of why the business community rallied and was able to stop RIFRA, but when it came to uh, women's rights, cause you know, everybody I, I assume know, has a mother or a sister or, or somebody with a pair of ovaries, um, why we weren't able to do it, the same thing with uh, HB 481. So that is the question I've been answering because I just can't understand it. Yeah, well, thank you so much for joining us. I know you might um, sign off while we're wrapping up a few questions. Um, yeah, um, I think that the point was made earlier by a couple people that, so, you know, you don't know until you know, certainly, um, but it, it can take personal experience even, you know, among women to be aware of the laws um, that are surrounding them. And, you know, that, that happened to me um, when I was visiting family, discovered that I was pregnant. And because of the financial payment options, um, I had to wait until I was back in my home state to, to get that um, in an affordable and safe way. And um, I think, yeah, oh, she took off. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the point that um, it does. We seem to need to break through a wall um, of awareness um, in these families. We've got um, a question coming in. Um, I'd like to sort of tailing on what Darshan just said. This is for Jim. Are you ready? Um, comes from Shelly Alpern. 20 years ago, big businesses were afraid to speak out to support LGBTQIA rights. Persistence and good business arguments turn them around. Uh, Rhea Ventures and others is working with shareholders in companies such as Home Depot, Coca-Cola, Southern Corp. I apologize, this was not a question, this was a comment. They'd love to work with you. So uh, put you in touch after. <laughs> Well, I, I, and I actually saw that and I responded. I sent her my email address and we look forward to oh, following yeah. up. But I, but I do think she raised an important point, um, which is we do need to work with big businesses and business, business forward does it every day. We work with small business owners and we also work with hundreds of the Fortune 500. We got helped get 190 CEOs to sign a letter of support for uh, the American Rescue Plan uh, a couple months ago. So we, we totally believe in, in, in working with big business. Um, I think, I think the, just you know, the, when it comes to just the example of uh, uh, marriage equality and, and, and other uh, rights for um, the LGBTQ community, one of the reasons why that works is because companies value that talent. Um, they're, they're, they're progressive on marriage equity because they're competing for the best and brightest and they know the best and brightest care about marriage equality. And, and it's, um, and, and, and so the market is really driving that. Um, and it's just, it's slow work. It, it really is. So I, 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 I do this because I think it's important. Um, I've just found that in a situ situation that we're in now, a crisis, you got to go to the people who can uh, help you now. I also think it's important um, to um, ask them to make arguments that persuade people in the middle who are undecided. Um, 
I'm drawn to this because I, I think it's important for economic quality. Uh, I'm very aware of the disparate impact it has uh, on poor women. Um, but I think sometimes we, what we try to do is we try to help small business leaders talk about the larger economic impact um, because that's what people in the middle who aren't really as, you know, paying as close attention as, as they might um, need, to, need to hear. So um, there are a lot of ways to go out and advocate for these issues. And uh, you just need to try to reach people where they are. Nicole, would you mind um, following up after that? Yeah, any um, last thoughts about strategies leveraging um, the resources that we have? Um, so I, you know, I do it's, think it's important to be thinking about and leveraging all of the resources at our disposal and really thinking about framing. And uh, I think someone mentioned this uh, in one of the questions about how we would frame our discussions. Like we, you know, we are not going to enter the same the same conversation with the same message for every stakeholder. And so um, for the business community, it's about, it may be the cost and the economy, the loss of businesses, the bottom line. Um, um, working with, in the women's community, it's about individual you know, bodily autonomy, um, rights, uh, you know, you enter the conversation in different ways. And so being able to have a strategy that's responsive to, you know, the, the constituency. Uh, and then, you know, I think there's, another person who talked about, well, how do you make the conversation, especially with business leaders, when they say, well, it's against my religion. How do we have those conversations? And, you know, um, and is it possible? Are those winnable conversations? And so um, this is a strategy moment, I think, for us in the movement to really be thinking about how we use data, research, what we know, but also um, what's necessary in this moment to not only for me, it's not enough to just push back on these restrictions. It's about solidifying, codifying the tenants in Roe versus Wade. Um, and um, one of the other points that I, I think I, I wanted to make earlier, I'm sorry, is that one of the things I do know is that women, when women have access to abortion, it's readily available. It not only speaks to that service, but also the other range of reproductive health services that are available to women uh, in the state. Um, and we know that, you know, those, it's not, it, you know, abortion is one, you know, one tool, one thing, but again, the full range of reproductive health services and also um, losing a reproductive justice framework, not, it's not only about the right to choose an abortion or to have an abortion, but also the right to be able to um, have a child um, that's healthy and safe and choose when to uh, procreate as well. Yeah, I think that's uh, such an important point. And as I've been reviewing some of the latest work put out by IWPR um, and in their new, in the, through the Center for Economics and Reproductive Health, I was noting, you know, that at least as often, you know, in your social media presence and your page, reminding folks, this is very much not just about abortion. This is about the ability to have prenatal care and to have postnatal care and to have, yeah, access to um, all of the affordable family planning services that science has created, but yet, yeah, there are these restrictions too. Um, looks like we have a few more minutes. Um, I'm just gonna bring up a couple questions and then if any of our remaining panelists would like to um, address it, you can start talking, raise your hand. We'll see how the Zoom handles that. Um, the question also has come up in um, the Q&A from people watching right now. A lot of people are curious about your answers. I think especially Jim um, and Nicole, things, yeah, that you, conversations that you have had um, with peers or community members who bring up their religious preferences or, you know, how, how you deal with the moral issue. Um, so I guess to, to come on a broader question, um, yeah. How can supportive individuals, you know, use either the data or their personal experiences or tips that you have to advocate for this kind of comprehensive reproductive health that we're talking about, whether it's in 
communities, faith-based organizations or groups that are not traditionally aware of this kind of health. Jim, great. <laughs> so um, um, when we have experience uh, with, with the question about religion, um, here's, here's the discussion that we have. Um, first, the, the substantial majority of Americans supports abortion rights. Um, and um, if a business uh, leader is saying, I have a, 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 a personal uh, a problem with the issue, they also have stockholders, they have customers, and they have employees. And they have a responsibility to those three constituency groups that is uh, apart from their personal views. And we speak to them in terms of what their employee, like it depends on what kind of business it is, but if it's a, and uh, a CEO of a company with a lot of employees, we know that the, the, you know, it's, it's very likely that the um, substantial majority of you know, the, the CEO's employees care about this. And what we're seeing is more and more uh, employees are expressing their views and they want their CEO to, to take positions. So I, th I think this is going to become more of a, uh, an opportunity for us as we go forward, but um, uh, it's just, you know, uh, um, your your personal views don't really control your obligation over a veto your obligation to other other um, others employees stockholders and customers. Um, it's another open question. If anyone wants to weigh in, um, how can researchers partner with corporate leaders and elected officials to leverage findings that? monetize the direct and indirect costs of reproductive health restrictions to inform policy. Um, Diana, I guess we, have, we got a researcher in the house, but no pressure. Um. Well, I think this um, excellent report by IWPR is a great example of trying to um, have research that speaks to policymakers. And when, um, if, you know, the federal government is no longer uh, in sh guaranteeing um, the right to an abortion, then it will go to states and having state level data that speaks to uh, state representatives and their uh, both their financial interests and their um, responsibility for taking care of the well being of families. Um, this sh seems like the right, this is will be necessary for uh, those state lawmakers to do the right thing. And I, you know, I'll just speak to IWPR. Uh, again, I think from my perspective and in my role here at IWPR, um, good research um, is only good if we use it, if we get it in the hands of the right people, stakeholders, so that they can take action on, on the findings. Um, research that sits on the shelf is just not useful to anyone. So um, from this work, and you know, we really, this is a really call, this is a call, this moment is a call uh, to action. There's, again, there's a real urgency to this moment. And so what we're hoping is that, um, you know, you, we have some support to continue this work, um, to help states be able to use this tool um, in, you know, in their legislatures uh, and also work with business leaders and states, uh, we really want to make sure that um, we, this tool is used far and wide. And, and the last thing I'll say, um, you know, I also um, teach participatory policy making. I do think that we you know, need to be making the case to businesses. But after I did a lot of work, um, you know, years ago on same-sex marriage, and we did, we spent a lot, a lot of time working with churches trying to convince them about same-sex marriage. And turns out they never changed their minds. So I, I think we also um, have to have a strategy about working with businesses who are open to the message, open to re-examining their workplace policies and understand what's at stake um, because um, you know, there's not a lot of time to waste convincing people who are motivated, motivated by higher power um, to make uh, these kinds of changes, even though some people can be moved. But I do think um, to the point, uh, someone in the chat that this is about strategy. This is not necessarily one about understanding the issues and what's at stake. We know what's at stake. It's really about how we think about moving on what we know to be true. Thank you. Um, Going to close with 
one more question for all the panelists. Um, and thank you again all so much for the range of expertise and insight that you've brought that, yeah, in a week such as this one does feel very strengthening uh, to me and I know other people watching this right now. Um, so how do you envision advocates using this research and web tool to engage elected officials and corporate leaders to take a stand against harmful reproductive health policies? And um, let's see. Great, Jim. Share your vision. Yeah. So, so um, again, uh, just sort of agreeing with uh, uh, Nicole again. So, so if you're going to be strategic, if this isn't really about the data, if this is if this is making an argument, and you are trying to persuade people, uh, what we find works is, you know, the economic development argument. Every state competes with every other state for for invest and new jobs. And we're talking about Georgia. Georgia's crushing it uh, because it's got a strong community and um, it is it is growing. And, and, and the only thing holding Georgia back is how, how good a job they can do taking care of the most vulnerable in their community. Um, and what we recommend is making these arguments about economic opportunity and economic equality in a way that shows that you know, we need to do this if we're gonna continue to win this competition for investment in jobs state representatives, state senators will respond if you frame it as, we can't do this to our state, it's going to hurt our ability to attract investment. And if we fall behind on investment, it's really hard to catch up. So, um, so what, you know, that's, that's, that's the argument that, we, that we've uh, shown works best. Um, again, it's persuading people in the middle. It may not be what gets you up in the morning. It may not be what brought you to the Zoom. But if you're focused on having an impact, that's what I would recommend. Great. Um, Diana, do you have any anything you're, you're looking forward to or hoping to see? I know you've been very patient in addressing this point already, but uh, yeah, any, any final thoughts on- I think if we only have one minute left, we should give it to Dr. Mason. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm just really excited about this tool. We've put in a lot of work and time and hours and, you know, you know, a lot of our work is really trying to figure out where the gaps are so that we can fill them and give the field more information to do their work more effectively um, to be able to make the case. And I think this tool does it really well. Um, it's just making sure that we work across our different communities of practice to understand and to make sure people understand the value of such a tool and how it might really uh, make the difference um, in terms of pushing against, back against these restrictions. Yeah, um, I certainly, yeah, I really appreciate that point and, and, and others that, that folks have made. And, um, you know, we didn't, we weren't able to get to all of folks' questions or all the questions we came up ahead of time. Um, but yeah, in the, the context of the upcoming SCOTUS fight and um, what IWPR and I were chatting about as the, um, she recovery or the recovery from the she session of the um, of COVID when we've seen um, a, yeah a, a surge in, in women leaving the workforce because they're having to do with family issues like this um, it's a lot to think about so thank you all so much for joining and for helping promote this new tool yeah thank you thank you for moderating thank you everyone. Uh, Janet for moderating, speakers for all the wonderful and very insightful pieces you brought to the conversation. This is the first of three discussions that will be happening today, so please stay tuned. The next one is really going to be focusing on exactly what they just closed with, this she session, and how do we demand action and make sure that racial and reproductive justice are centered as we work to make it out of this pandemic, recognizing that it has disproportionately impacted women of color. And so we'll be taking a quick break, but before we do that, I want everyone to know to please keep an eye out for micro briefings, which we will be announcing on our website and we'll make sure to send information out to participants of today's event, letting them know when those are happening. 
Those will be shorter, more targeted discussions that will be presented to specific stakeholders on sharing tools and best practices in terms of how to use the newly released data and the website so that advocates can engage with elected officials and corporate partners in getting them to help with all of the restrictions that keep popping up at an alarming rate. So after the break, we are very excited to announce that we will be having a moderated conversation between Dr. Nicole Mason and Alexis McGill Johnson, the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood, along with Christine Clark, the program officer from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. And so they will be talking again about the she session, how we recover, and all of the important topics that have already been brought up and just continuing the conversation and setting the stage for the panel that follows that, which will be moderated by Galina Spinoza, president and editor in chief of Rewire News Group. And then the other participants of that panel, the speakers will be Erminia Palacio, president and CEO of the Guttmacher Institute, Shannon Rees, executive director of Atlanta Jobs with Justice, Anne Marie Benitez from the National Institute of Latinas, sorry, the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice, and Marcella Howell, the president and founder of In Our Own Voice, the National Black Women's Reproductive Justice Agenda. So please tune in. Um, we will be back and we'll be starting at 1.30 promptly. In the meantime, you're welcome to go check out the web tool. It is now live and we look forward to continuing this conversation with all of you. <laughs> 